This lecture will cover Ancelostoma duodenale, Nicator americanus, and Ancelostoma brasiliense, the hookworms. I'm Dr. Paul Pottinger. The objectives for this lecture on the hookworms is to understand their life cycle so that you can break that cycle, appreciate the epidemiology, who gets infected and where, and be able to make a diagnosis. Recognize that clinical presentation, in particular the fact that there are human hookworms and there are dog hookworms which can sometimes accidentally get into humans. Know how to make the diagnosis based on testing and become at least familiar with the treatment options for hookworm infection. Here's the map of life. We're still in the helminths. These are GI nematodes, Ancelostoma and Nicator. And for both of those worms, they behave essentially exactly the same way. The life cycle starts at the bottom of the screen, not at the top. This is not an infection you get by eating contaminated food or drink, but just by walking barefoot uh, through contaminated soil. Yes, there are microscopic infectious filariform worms, and they will burrow right through your intact skin. This is fecal soil skin transmission, different from Ascaris uh, and the other worms we've talked about. Once that happens, what goes on here is that these microscopically small worms will make their way into the intact skin, and they will burrow around under the epidermis until they penetrate the dermis, get swept up into the vascular supply, and make their way up into the right side of the heart. They get pumped out into the lungs, and in the lungs they will begin to mature. This is very similar to what we see in Ascaris infections. And just like in Ascaris, once they have matured, they will be coughed up swallowed, make their way through the stomach and into the jejunum where they will begin to mature in the small intestines. Boy will meet girl, they fall in love, they have sex, and they begin to pump out eggs. The key is that they don't like to expend their precious energy fighting against the fecal stream. Instead, they like to spend their energy fornicating. And they can do this because they are built to hold on for dear life. In the case of Ancelostoma, they have these sort of vampire looking fangs with Nicator, they have these cutting plates. Both of these worms use those mouth parts to hold on to your small intestines, taking quite literally a bite out of you and sucking your blood. So that keeps them from getting swept out uh, with the feces and they also get nourished as they suck your blood over time. And what they do, of course, is they make eggs, many, many eggs, and eventually the eggs will get passed in the feces. If we defecate indiscriminately into the ground, they'll be deposited there. And then over a period of about one week, they will mature and eventually hatch into uh, larvae that can penetrate the skin uh, of the next passerby. So human hookworm infection by definition is an anthroponosis. There is a closely related dog hookworm we'll talk about in a few moments. Not oral but skin penetration for the life cycle. And again as before those eggs have to exit the body to complete their life cycle. They have to embryonate in the soil. They cannot hatch inside the human body. Each adult is tiny. They're only a centimeter long, but they can live for years. And because each female will make 20,000 eggs per day, this infection can persist in a community for a very long time indeed. Where does this happen? Well, it happens throughout the tropics. And in fact, there's a tremendous amount of overlap with some of the other worms we've talked about, Trichurus, the whipworm, and Ascaris, the giant roundworm. In fact, it's said that together, these three form a so-called unholy trinity of parasitology. Any place where there's poor sanitation and warm weather and bare skin, the, this particular hookworm infection will flourish. It's felt that there are hundreds of millions of people who are infected, and as you might imagine, it is children who are poorly clothed uh, who are disproportionately heavily affected by this infection. How does it present clinically? Well, the idea is that early on, the illness may show up as the worms penetrate through your skin or your lungs, and later on you'll have a high worm burden in the GI tract, and so late infection will present differently. Again, early on there is a skin migration phase, and we call that rash the rash cutaneous larva migrans. Literally means worms moving through your skin. Cutaneous larva migrans, as you can see in these panels, it can show up in different ways, but the classic presentation is an intensely itchy in medical terms, pruritic rash, and it can also classically seem to creep along. Something that creeps in medicine is called a serpiginous process. And as you can see in the panel at the top, this looks almost like a worm. Now that's not the worm itself. There's a microscopically small larva that has been migrating under the skin and it's leaving in its track, uh, in its wake, well, sort of a track of inflammatory uh, allergic type response. Uh, in the case of the person in the bottom panel, this is somebody who went to the tropics and decided to wear a bikini, 
and lay down on her belly on the beach, and so the worms penetrated right through uh, her belly wall. What's happening here, of course, is that uh, IgE is the allergic type uh, chemo mediator that is bringing on an allergic response by the host to these foreign invaders. And when IgE comes to the response, it elicits the release of histamine. When histamine is released in local tissues, that's very, very itchy. In fact, it's so itchy that sometimes people will scratch themselves into a secondary bacterial infection. Now, if you do nothing for this, gradually that IgE-mediated response will simmer down and these patients' rash will eventually um, uh, disappear, usually over a period of uh, days or a few weeks. Eventually, those larvae will migrate to the lungs. When they reach the lungs, we have something that's similar to Ascaris, the giant roundworm. Most people have no symptoms in the lungs, but sometimes you can have an eosinophilic pneumonitis or inflammatory lung process. Again, IgE is the chemical mediator here, and that can lead to cough, wheezing, chest pain. On rare occasions, people will actually cough up blood. That's called hemoptysis. If you check a chest x-ray at just the right time, you may see a bronchopneumonia type infiltrate or shadow on the x-ray. If you look in the sputum, you may see rich eosinophil uh, findings, and in some cases, you won't see the eosinophils themselves, but rather the classic Charcot Leiden crystals. All that tells you is that there are a lot of eosinophils down deep in the lungs. Yes, just like with Ascaris, we call this Luffler's syndrome. Now, once they've made their way out of the lungs and into the intestines, we have an established GI infection. And just like with Ascaris, most people have no symptoms whatsoever. But uh, unlike Ascaris, patients will rarely say, oh, I just pooped and passed a bunch of adult worms. No, they're so small, only a centimeter long, and they also hold on for dear life. And so that's rarely the way these patients will present. Usually if they do come to attention, it will be with a nonspecific GI syndrome of nausea, belly pain, and sometimes diarrhea as well. The concern is for the complication of GI infection, which is called hookworm anemia. What you see in this panel here is a cross-section uh, sagittally right through uh, a worm as it is taking a bite out of someone's small intestine. As you can imagine, each adult worm, although they only suck uh, less than a cc of blood per day, if you have a lot of these worms over a long period of time in a very small patient, a young child, this may contribute to growth restriction because of hookworm anemia. And it's one of the main reasons why this worm is such an important one from a public health perspective. Now, you should understand that there is also dog hookworm. Uh, dog hookworm is similar, but it's actually a lot more simple than that. The way it works is that you have Fido taking a dump on the beach, depositing the eggs of his own Ancelostoma brasiliense worm, and if someone walks along, they may get infected when this uh, filariform microscopic infectious larva burrows into the skin. The difference is that it's built for dogs, not people, and so it never makes its way into the circulation. It can't get through the dermis. Instead, it creeps along, sometimes it's called the creeping eruption, under the skin, eliciting that same IgE-mediated intensely itchy allergic response, but it never actually sets up an advanced infection. Doomed to wander in the skin until they die after a number of weeks, meanwhile the poor patient is scratching like crazy. So, how do you make a diagnosis? You need the clinical suspicion. Does your patient have a rash, either on presentation or by history, maybe by a picture on their cell phone, and have they been to an area of poor sanitation and walked barefoot there? If so, first of all, check the poop. If it's a human hookworm infection, they should have eggs in the poop. Have them deposit a specimen, look at it under the microscope, and if so, you may see these eggs. They have a very classic, smooth surface to them, and you can see the lobes of the embryo right uh, inside. If you see that, you've made a diagnosis of human hookworm. And of course, if the patient shows up not with GI symptoms, but just with this rash, look, you won't know whether this is cutaneous larva migrans or whether it's creeping eruption. Either way, whether it's human hookworm or dog hookworm, the treatment is going to be the same. What do we do to treat these patients? We give them medicines. There are two drugs that work quite well. One is called albendazole, the other is called ivermectin. Both are taken by mouth, both are well absorbed, and both of them will make their way into the patient's tissues through the bloodstream. So whether it's the intestinal phase uh, or cutaneous larva migraines, the same drug works quite well. You have your choice of either of those. The issue, of course, is managing the complications. For people with an itchy rash, give them antihistamines. You don't want them scratching and setting up a secondary infection. And of course, if you're working uh, with young children who are heavily infected, 
they need to have repletion of their iron. Once you kill off the worms, they need to try to catch up and uh, regain some of the growth that they have lost. In terms of breaking the cycle, of course, it is about enhanced public health, better sanitation, letting people deposit their feces where they should, going through communities and giving them either albendazole or ivermectin on a periodic basis to kill off the worms that have gotten into their system, and of course they should wear shoes. If you shod your uh, patients, they will be at lower risk of acquiring this particular infection. I would emphasize that there's hope in the future potentially for a vaccine against hookworm. There's certainly a major need for this, and because there is a tissue migration phase, in theory it's possible to elicit a humoral immune response that could help to clear these worms before they set up an established infection. And in fact, there's a group led, led by Dr. Peter Hotez, which is trying to do this. In the graph I show you here from one of his recent papers, you can see that if we give drug treatment alone, we will clear populations of their hookworms more slowly than if we can give drugs and vaccinations. It's a wonderful mathematical model and we have hopes for this. The reality is that this vaccine does not exist. There has never been an effective Helminth vaccine. And so I think in the meantime, you as a clinical doctor need to understand that you're going to have to recognize and treat hookworm infection one by one. So that's the key concepts for ancelostoma on the left and nicator on the right. These are called hookworms. They're nematodes with very tiny adults that have smooth eggs. And the transmission is by feces to the soil and then through your skin. And it includes that lung migratory phase. It happens throughout the tropics, especially in kids. And unless we fix their sanitation situation, they are commonly reinfected. It'll start with cutaneous larva, larva migraines rash, then a Luffler's syndrome, eosinophilic pneumonitis, and then some GI upset or, in severe cases, iron deficiency hookworm anemia. Make a diagnosis when you see the rash of cutaneous larva migraines, or check the poop and look for those eggs. We treat with albendazole or ivermectin. Either of those drugs is fine, and we'll make prevention uh, efforts by improving sanitation and putting shoes onto these patients. Someday we may have an effective vaccine. Thank you so much for your attention.